this really incredible landscape. I loved it. It's, it's full of volcanoes and, and Padamo and beaches and Galapagos, a lot of very different uh, ecosystems in that area. And, and it's kind of a volatile area too. You know, you have a lot of different uh, political upheavals. And while I was there in 2005, it was, it was at the same time when Lucio Gutierrez was uh, just about to be overthrown. And so sure enough, they had this huge revolt in the streets, there were tanks in the streets, there were tear gas bombs raining down everywhere. It was a terrible idea uh, to go out in the streets. Um, I actually got hit with this one, but I remember sending these little photo dispatches to my parents and my dad saying, no, you get your butt home. You are not going out in this. A lot of bad ideas, a lot of bad ideas. And I also just recently finished up a, a shoot in South Africa for the Save Our Seas Foundation. This is a really cool story going to, to False Bay in this area just south of Cape Town where the Atlantic meets the Indian Ocean. So inherently you have this very wild water situation meeting this really urban population. And sure enough, you know, in these, in these mixing of waters where you have lots of shark activity uh, and also lots of people hitting the beach, you end up having a lot of negative interactions. Um, you have shark bite victims. You have surfers that have, have had shark bites. And, and so I spent a lot of time in the water with sharks, a lot of sharks. Um, one of the most densely populated area of these seven gill cow sharks in the world actually was right here and my first time really on scuba. Um, another bad idea, uh, <laughs> really bad idea. Um, but I love doing this. I love telling these different stories, and I love using imagery to bring those stories to the public um, because photography can be a really powerful tool. Um, actually, before we keep going, can you guys see these okay? Or should we turn down the lights? Let's, can we turn them off again? No? They're censored? Okay. Can we turn the, any of these back ones off? I've seen a couple people in the back, like, getting glare. Oh, there we go. You saved the night. Thank you. Yeah, good man. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent two years living in, in Honduras along the Congreja River and teaching photography to kids and also getting them out outside and getting them to connect with their with their kind of backyard habitats. And I love this because their backyard was pretty spectacular. I mean, literally their backyard. You look out their their window and this is what they're looking at, Pico Bonito National Park. But it's also again a very volatile area because in this, in this small little town up this little watershed, you end up having a lot of poaching. And you have a lot of uh, illegal logging and, and slash and burn agriculture. So our idea was to introduce photography as a way to get kids involved, get them connected with nature, and hopefully start seeing it in a different way. Um, and maybe you know, in a more inspired way, get them more emotionally connected to their landscape. And so, bad idea number three, uh, <laughs> every day we would drive up this watershed, and this is actually Simon here in the photo. Every day we drive up this watershed road, this bumpy road, and, and I'd look off to the right and I'd see this huge waterfall cascading off the mountainside. The Huco waterfall is what it was called. And we used to go on hikes up to this big waterfall, and you know, you'd look up, you can, you can barely even see the top, it was so big, and I'm thinking, you know, God, that's got to look really pretty up on top. So. We're going to bushwhack all the way up through the woods and get there and because I really want to take this photo. And so we bushwhack all the way up to the top. And I'm like, wow, that is a crazy view. You're looking down at the Congre Hall River. You're looking at this little lip, which is very unimpressive, right? Really unassuming in this photo. But it's this, this massive torrent that's, that's tumbling down, oh, who knows, you know, over 100 feet. And so I was saying, well, that photo is not good enough. I really, what I really want is to try to show the waterfall rushing in and how it's connected to the river and how am I going to do that? Well, I'll go back up and I'll bring some climbing rope with me and I'll talk to these local guides. And so I ask them, you know, in Honduras, you know, nobody tells you, oh, I don't know. They just make something up. And so you say, how, how big is Bejuco? And they're like, 120 feet. No problem, 120. I was like, great, I got 100, 
180 foot rope, perfect. And I asked a couple other guys, they're like, yeah, 100 foot, no problem. So I go up there and my plan is to take a photo right at sunrise as the sun's coming up over the Nombre de Dios Mountains and it's lighting up this huge churning waterfall. And, and so I get over, get over the edge and I start rappelling down. So I'm rappelling down pre-dawn and it kind of comes out like this, you know, it kind of has a little lip like that. And so I start getting off and I, and I go down about 20, 30 feet. And my plan was just to shoot my photo as the sun broke and then rappel all the way the rest of the way down, get off on the ground, walk back around. Well, I started going down and came over that like hump to where I could finally see like the rope and the rope was just dangling like 50 feet over, <laughs> over the ground. And I was like, oh, those guys lied. <laughs> they lied pretty good. And I didn't really have a way out. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. But luckily, I had brought, and you can see it in the photo, I brought uh, another piece of rope just to hold my tripod on so I could actually you know, position myself off the wall. Um, and what I ended up doing is just tying little prussic knots and just like inching my way back up hand over hand, but eventually got it. I got the shot. So this is, this is what we do. Terrible ideas. But we do it to try to show you know, a greater vision. We have this kind of Labrador mentality where it's like this shiny red ball, got to chase it, got to chase it. And fortunately for my parents, I don't tell them about these ideas beforehand. I just show them the photos afterwards. So it's a cool life. Um, a lot of times, you know, we do a lot of aerial stuff. We get into airplanes, and it's, people think it's kind of like this Indiana Jones thing. And it's really not. You know, it's not as glamorous as it looks. A lot of times, you're covered in, in spider webs. If you can see it there on the screen, that is just a mask of spider webs. And actually, my buddy Adam Chasey and, and Karen Dyer, we used to have this game down in the, in the Everglades that when you're boating into these mangrove tunnels, we would see who would keep uh, the most spiders on them all at once and who would be the first one to sit in the, in the bow of the boat. I won. I won that one. It commonly looks like this. You know, that's a, that's a common scene. This is. Uh, Lake Okeechobee, and of course, you know, we go out into the field, we eat whatever is around. In Ecuador, you eat rodents. Yep, not as good as it looks. Um, <laughs> and they, yeah, and they serve with a face on. Like, that's so crazy to me. It's like, nah. and, and I used to have this huge list of friends, you know, that always wanted to come with me camping and hiking and doing all this, and, and sure, and I was like, yeah, okay, you know, we're going to go out, like, watch you take photos, and yeah, it'll be an adventure, it'll be fun. And then they come out, and then they realize that it's, you know, going to start way before sunrise. It's going to go way after sunset, and we're getting lost in swamps and just kind of like flying by the seat of our pants. And then dinner menu comes out, and it's kind of <laughs> grab whatever you can. And so in this very special plate, it's a, uh, a Frisbee served with uh, English muffins, toasted by a butane lighter with cream cheese and Doritos and a t tomato on top. I now have two friends. And, and Chasey, you ate this. You love this. Yeah, yeah. He's still my friend, which is, he has a small list of friends too, I guess. But we do this, and, and, and we do it because we see, you know, potentially bad situations, and we like to turn them into good situations. So when you're broken down on the side of the road, on Dead Dog Road in the Everglades, instead of saying, man, these mosquitoes are tearing me up, we think, oh, there's a, a photo that I can make here. And we like making these photos because we like telling stories. And I like telling stories because I like connecting people with where they are, with bigger issues. And here in the South, here in Florida in particular, we have a big issue that a lot of the people that live here just aren't connected with home with where they call home. You know, a lot of these people aren't, aren't willing to go wade out and really see what makes Florida, Florida. And if these people aren't going out and seeing the real Florida and seeing old Florida the way that I've grown up to know it, then how are we then going to expect those same people to then advocate for its protection, right? to advocate for its conservation? We can't. So my idea is to take photos and people who can't get there physically to, to translocate them uh, if not, let them live vicariously through them. And so I try my best to, to put myself in situations where, where people look at photos and they say, well, cool, but where's the photographer? 
And I love doing this because it, it makes people spend a little bit longer on the image. They're thinking, okay, uh, I don't know, is that under a rock? What's going on? And I love setting things up like this. And it's fairly simple in some cases. Fairly, sometimes not so simple. Um, but this one is the easiest wildlife photo I've ever shot. This is, in, this is in my parents' backyard. A family of sandhill cranes has found our bird feeder. And they just come and they just slam it. And, and their little colt comes to and they just come and pick stuff up. And so one morning I was like, you know what? I'm just going to cover my camera in Spanish moss and I'm going to set it out there. And you know, I took a couple of test frames. Don't give me crap for my, my Crocs, um, my style choice. And so I put up a couple of test frames and you start getting these incredible perspectives that you, you never would otherwise. And that's what we like to do. We like to take people into these different lives of these animals in this flora and fauna. And then I'll you know, maybe dig a hole and, and put the camera in the hole and make it look up and see what that looks like. Because why not? Why not? And so I started doing this a long time ago here in Gainesville. I grew up in Gainesville. I went to, I went to Eastside. And I fell in love with all the little backcountry oases that we have. And as soon as I, my parents let me use a car, um, I was out, I was gone, and just exploring. And my favorite thing was to just leave, you know, before this first period bell rings, go out and explore some of these areas that are around. This is Hogtown Creek, can you believe it? Hogtown Creek. Go explore some of these areas before the sun rises and just see what we have. And so I'd show up to school all muddy and, and just like the biggest smile on my face because I'd seen this stuff, you know? Mud snakes. I'd seen ospreys swooping down on the water not to catch a fish, but to clean their talons off after having eaten a fish. That's nuts. And these are the kind of stories I was trying to tell my friends in high school. I was like, guys, you wouldn't believe what I saw today. And my photos were terrible. I mean, they're horrible. And so they'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, that's pretty cool, Mac. And I'd be like, no, it's way better than this. Hold on. And, you know, I'd try to go take better and better photos. And so that's what pushed me to get into photography and to start kind of communicating was just a kind of Proof of life, I guess, you know? Oh, this morning I hung out with coyotes or, or, you know, trying to translate just everyday scenes into something maybe a little more artistic. And I love getting close to wildlife. By the way, can you see the owl there? I don't know if that's coming through. And so I love getting close to wildlife, and wildlife doesn't necessarily always love me getting close to it. I get the cold shoulder, then I'll speak a little, you know, give it a little smooth talk, and then they, you know, warm right up. And I love in Florida that we have this kind of land before time landscape here. And we really do. You know, we're surrounded by reptiles and, you know, massive predators and, and, and turtles and snakes and everything. And so I, I try to, you know, a lot of my images kind of have that wide angle close up feel because I like that feel of, of, of kind of this fern gully type uh, situation. And, and I revisit scenes all the time. You know, I just try to find scenes that communicate to me what is Florida, what is the Florida I know and love. But I'm never happy with just one. I always have to keep going back. So I think, oh, you know, what was this look like uh, under fog and a moon? And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Not quite satisfied. Let's see what it looks like when you put a light behind it and you leave the shutter open for 10 minutes. That's pretty cool. And then just a couple of months ago, I'm eating dinner with my parents. And they always, you know, they're, they're so sweet. My mom is such a good cook, too. And so it pains me every time. And she asks, and she's like, Mac, are you going to, you know, have dinner with us tonight? And I'm like, ah, dinner is like right at sunset. It's like right at that golden hour. Can we start eating at 9? Uh, and I was like, yes, Mom. And she cooked this delicious meal. And sure enough, you know, right as we're in the middle of dinner, I look out, and there's just that beautiful storm mixed with sunset light. And I grabbed my camera and I bolted. Yeah, right? Florida, you know? It's Florida. We are surrounded. This is 10 minutes from here. We are surrounded by stuff like this all over the place. And I want to bring this to people's homes. Like, I still see the world through the eyes of a child. And so I try to incorporate that kind of curiosity into, into my photography whenever I can. And, and now, unfortunately for a lot of us, is we're up.
comments weren't in the photo. Um, and they're doing that so they can get this higher perspective, right? So I started thinking, well, they're using these road cones, uh, the airline is, to mark where their burrows are so that the landscaping company doesn't come in and mow over them. So what I did is, you know, what I typically do is I try to grab my camera and I go in real close and move the road cone aside. And, of course, the burrowing owls see this, like, you know, T-Rex looking thing looking down at them and they're not having it. So they, they just, you know, they move over and they don't end up in any of my photos. And I racked my brain on it and I just didn't know what to do. And sure enough, I, I take my camera away, put the road cone back and bro, I'll just come right back up, stand on top of the road cone. And I'm like, oh, right, a road cone. So I went and grabbed the road cone, carved out a hole, and put it right down in front of the burrowing owl nest. And what do you get? You get a custom-made camera trap, super easy. And you get stuff like this. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> they used to call these, Native Americans used to call these birds breakneck birds because of this you know, 180 degree uh, turn that they would do. And, I, and, and this is actually a six month project. It took a very long time because I kept getting photos of birds' butts. You know, like they just like block the camera and just not care and just kind of stand in front of it. So what I decided to do, I then set my timer to have a two second beep uh, right before it would click the shutter. So, you know, go beep beep. And then owls are like, what is that? And you get stuff like this, you know. You get this very, you know, chest out, let's fight, let's brawl. But this is Florida. I mean, and we, we have a very much a blank canvas here in this state. And for, for those of us with a little bit of imagination, a little bit of creativity, and a little bit of adventure, you can turn something ordinary into something extraordinary. And I went out and I, I found this tree. This is down near Orlando. I found this tree, and the first time I saw this tree, I was like, yeah, this is cool. This is like a Dr. Seuss you know, creation. And I knew exactly what I was going to do, so I returned back to this tree. I slung up a hammock in it, and I spent a whole weekend there. I spent a whole weekend. So, you know, you had this eight-foot deep lake, and I had this 10-foot tripod. worked just fine until it fell into the water a couple of times. But what I'd do is I'd set these 30-second exposures, and I'd swim, or paddle over to the hammock, and then I'd lay in the hammock, and I'd light it up furiously. I did this all night for three nights, all day. I just, I just didn't sleep at all until we kept getting better and better waiting for the moon just to rise over the horizon so it paints that cypress tree, just that slight little amber glow, just like a sunrise would, and light up the hammock. Back away 100 yards, what does that look like? And it's all just because, why not? What are you doing on your weekends? I don't know. I'll go sleep in a tree. That sounds cool. Let's do it. And besides just sleeping in a tree, these are the other things that you get to see. Roosts. I'd never known about this, how they have this kind of hierarchy, you know, of which birds get to roost where. You know, the vultures in the very top and the egrets at the bottom. Never would have known that. Night exposures. Sunrise comes. You get to see this. Light paints even further. And this is all just because I wanted to take a picture in a cypress tree. You know, you get lucky. You get lucky if you get out. And that's what we want to do. We want to get people out. We want to put their heads under the water and see what we have here in North Central Florida. See what we have. Because despite all those places I've traveled, the Honduras, the Ecuador, you know, South Africa, I can honestly tell you that I get the most excited when I come back and I shoot here. Because what we have here rivals anything else that I've seen. And we're being told a totally different story all the time. Our billboards are telling it, our TVs are telling it, you know, come to Disney World, let's come play golf, come to the beach, you know, relax. The real fun, the real Florida, the real soul of where we live and what we call home is in this stuff, is in these monster storms that come through. It's in the crystal clear waters that you can see for seemingly miles, right? That's home. That's the stuff you can't build, right? That's the stuff that we should be enjoying. And not only have we been told kind of these, these falsehoods for the longest time about you know, where the real entertainment is, we've actually designed this, this falsehood that, that swamps, that these places that are our backyard wilderness are scary and spooky and dangerous. We actually used to tell the, the foreigners, the Brits, 
when they were coming over fighting the Revolutionary War, stay out of swamps because they're, they're haunted, right? Stay out of them because those were our refuges, yeah? They're full of evil spirits and, and ghosts and things like that. And so it kept people out of swamps. And it continues to keep people out of swamps, you know? But our state is one that is surrounded and defined by water. Where we live is wetlands. And our water intake, our agriculture, depends on it. And yet still, these swamps are treated like these red-headed stepchildren of, of habitats. You know? They're second-class ecosystems all the time. They get the back seat. And why is that? Well, maybe it's because, yeah, we have gators and we have snakes. We have things that bite. But the more that we come to learn about these landscapes, the more secrets we're starting to unlock about habitat speciality, about the interactions and the interconnectivity, the connectivity of habitats and watersheds and, and these flyways, too. And you can't have one without the other. And despite all that this, this rich life that abounds here in the swamps, they still have a really bad name. And I guess I can understand it. You know, many people are, are uncomfortable with this idea of, of going into, into the swamp, into Florida's black water. I love it. And I love it. Because how often do you get the chance to feel vulnerable nowadays, right? How, how often do you get the feeling that you are not top dog here? And so I try to seek out these moments where you get that feeling, where you get the feeling like I'm in someone else's world because you feel humbled a little bit. And I got humbled real bad in this situation, <laughs> big time. This is with uh, the TV show star Chris Gillette from Gator Boys. And I saw him doing one of his shows one day, and I said, you know, Chris, I'd love to come photograph you, but like, underwater doing your thing. Can I do that? And he said, sure, Mac, yeah. I'm going to need you to sign here and here and here and here and here. <laughs> So I got in the water with them, and, and we backed these gators up into a corner. And by the way, we were supposed to be photographing these, what he called his teddy bears, his big boys that had been around him for, for years and years that he loved handling. And so I get down there to uh, the wildlife outpost, and I show up, and I'm all eager. I've got my underwater gear. I've got my wetsuit ready to go, feeling pretty good, get into the area. And he says, yeah, Mac, um, teddy bear gators, they aren't here. Instead, what we have are six nuisance, wild-caught, fresh-caught gators from Big Cypress. Caught the, the day before. And I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> it's going to get real. And so I hooked up this rig, and I got underwater. And you know, we have so many preconceptions about gators being these ferocious man-eaters and stuff. They want nothing to do with us. They want absolutely nothing to do with us. So when we got in the water, they all started holing up in this corner, and Chris was feeling uneasy about it, and finally he said, you know what, I'll just come in over top of them. And as soon as he did, you know, I'm only, it looks like I'm pretty far away from this, but I'm maybe two feet away from this big nine-foot in front, and, well, and all these big gators in front. And so what he does is in he, he reaches down and he looks at me and he's like, you ready? And I said, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and he reaches down and he picks it up and as soon as he starts picking it up, that thing just bolts out and nails me in the shoulder and just knocks me down. His foot's caught up in my underwater housing. It's, I'm like thrashing with it, you know. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> it's yours. It's yours. I survived. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but I love these places, and I love these wetlands, and I love these swamps. And so I started seeking out these swamps. I started seeking out these areas, you know, where the concrete turns to water, and started seeking out all these, you know, different wildlife, these different visions. And of course, for me, growing up in Gainesville, the swamps here was like a gateway drug, because I had to have more, and I had to have bigger and better. And so I headed down to only the natural, you know, only natural step next, which was the Everglades. And so I headed down to the Everglades to work with the National Audubon Society. And a lot of the ways that I ended up doing this stuff was to work as a biologist, to get the access, to get into the deep areas where people won't frequently go. And also you learn so much more. I mean, I spent so much time with biologists that knew and felt and cared for the habitat, and that ultimately rubbed off on me. And I started this five-year project 
to document, to explain, and hopefully to reintroduce the Everglades in, in a new light to people who, who all we hear about, you know, are pythons and, and, and you know, and square groupers and, uh, you know, the crazy 80s down in the Everglades. Everglades is so much more, but it's huge. You know, we talk about the Everglades, and most people think, yes, the national park. But it's not just a national park. It's a 100-mile watershed that expends, extends all the way up to Orlando and all the way down to Florida Bay. And it starts after leaving Lake Okeechobee. You get into these pond apple sloughs, which are these beautiful, ancient, the ones that are remaining, ancient sloughs of these gnarly trees. And on these trees grow all kinds of orchids and all types of different uh, fauna and flora that flock to these trees. And of course, as you leave the pond apples, you then get into the sawgrass prairies. And the sawgrass prairies, which are defined by these massive torrential rains in the summer and in the dry season in the winter. And you get down at their level, and you start walking around, and you're feeling that icky squish between your toes, which is really just periphyton. It's this, this very necessary complex that feeds, that fuels all the, all the prey-based fish, that fuels all the birds, that fuels all the gators, that fuels all the bigger game fish. This little thing right here, periphyton. And then you get into the cypress sloughs. You get into these beautiful old growth cypress stands down there in the Everglades. And the cypress stands are a little bit different down there because it's subtropical Florida. Lots of different, different wildlife. There's different flora as well. You get into these other bigger stands. I don't know if you all can see the, the owl that's there calling to its mate on the, on the limb. But these are the kind of things I seek out. And as soon as you leave the cypress trees, you then get into the mangrove swamps. And just as you're leaving the mangrove swamps, you then get into, of course, Florida Bay. That's the last stop of the River of Grass. So they call it a River of Grass because it's this constantly yet slow-moving watershed that spills all the way down to Florida Bay. And so we talk about it, and it's this beautiful system, right? But it's not. <laughs> Sorry, it is. But it's not just that. You know, there are lots of issues down there. And what we've done in, over the last just 60 years, you know, the Everglades is 6,000 years old, and what we've done in the last 60 years has been turning this into this. And we're doing it faster and faster, more and more, all the time. And what happened is we first started to see the Everglades. You know, Florida was the first state to be discovered, yet the last to really be truly explored. And as soon as we started getting into the interiors, you know, people's eyes started getting big with, oh, you know, you could drain this, you can cut it down, you can drain it, and we can start planting enough agriculture to feed everybody in the country. And it became this big agricultural hub. You start raising oranges to feed all, you know, everyone in America, essentially. And so you take the river of grass, and just south of Lake Okeechobee, when you start damming up the lake, the mother lake, the lake that feeds the entire watershed, and you turn it into sugar cane. Endless River of Sugar came. And so I used all kinds of tools to try to tell these different types of stories. And one of my favorite tools is aerial. I love getting up in planes and seeing the different textures of the Everglades. If you can see what that is, these are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of log trees, just right at first light. These are only some of the views you get. And of course, the American crocodiles flying over the Everglades in the winter, watching the American crocodiles, the endangered species, basking on the banks in some of the more remote areas. Of course, telling the Everglades story, you have to get underwater, too. You've got to stick your head underwater. And you tell people, you tell them, Mom, I'm going to go snorkeling in the Everglades. She's like, OK. <laughs> it's terrible. But it's actually way different than you think it is. You know, it's not muddy, mucky, messy. It is crystal clear. This is a swamp in the Everglades. Can you believe it? That water, before we started damming it up and dredging it, was as clean as it av Avion, you know? And there's still parts of it that are like that today. You go snorkeling around the Everglades, you see loads of gar, you see alligators, you see turtles. And everybody loves to come down to South Florida, and they love to go to the, to the coral reefs. And they're very cool to snorkel, and they're very cool to scuba dive. But for me, the party is at the mangroves. The mangroves are where the party's at. Because what happens is you have this very homogenous looking system above the water, right? Everything's green, waxy leaves. It's all the same. It all looks the same. But as soon as you put your head underwater, as soon as you put your head underwater, it turns into this Dr. Seuss kaleidoscope of, of, of you know, soft corals, of algaes, of invertebrates, 
all kinds of things. It's amazing. It's incredible. And there are mangroves everywhere. Just put your head underwater. Do it. It's great. There are places, too, in the, in the, so, in the southern part of the Everglades, right around the Keys, where what is, you know, at 3 o'clock, this hard, sturdy ground, in two hours as the high tide starts coming up, these mangroves get flooded. And all of a sudden, all these horseshoe crabs start coming in. And what happens when horseshoe crabs come in? Sharks come in. Yes, loads and loads of sharks. You take this dry ground, and all of a sudden, you have you know, over 80 sharks just swimming around you, or puppy dogs, I like to call them. Beautiful little guys, little lemon sharks. And they use these mangrove habitats as nurseries. They use them. Because as soon as they get big enough, they then head out onto the reefs. So I spent a lot of time around these sharks along the mangroves. And I started kind of trying to break down the Everglades into some, some manageable bite-sized pieces. And for me, just like a writer would do, I like to break it down in, into kind of chapters, right? And I wanted the Everglades story to start at Lake Okeechobee, which is that mother lake we talked about. And so I pick an iconic species. I pick a character, a protagonist. And in this case, it's the Everglades snail kite. And these birds are really, really pretty incredible because they have these hooked bills and they have these very long kind of fingernail-like talons. They're very long. And they have these really broad wings because what they do is they soar over the wetlands and they find apple snails. And that's pretty much all they eat. It's an amazing relationship. So I went down to Lake Okeechobee and I, and I started photographing them. I mean, I was riding around in airboats all day and, you know, taking telephoto shots and, getting a, you know, some, some decent stuff, at least to show how this bird fits into the habitat. But what I really like to do, and you guys saw with the sandhill crane, you saw with the burrowing owls, is I really like to kind of sketch out, and sometimes I mean that quite literally. And actually, Mike Keyes, one of the biologists that I've worked with, has been a victim of, of these sketches, <laughs> sending him something and saying, hey, this is what I want to do. How can we make it work? Or can we make it work? And so I sent this down to a biologist down in, in Okeechobee, and he laughed at me, and he's like, yeah, you're going to get a, a kite to come down to your camera? I was like, well, you know, I was talking with another biologist, and apparently you guys had this big study where you put satellite tags on the backs uh, of these kites, and didn't you get them to come in by having, you know, some snails ready for them? And he's like, yeah, 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 I guess that's true. I was like, well, let's give it a go. And uh, here's how it went. Photographing the Everglades snail kite was definitely one of the most challenging and stressful projects I've ever taken on. The majority of their population exists in and around Lake Okeechobee, which is the seventh largest freshwater lake in the United States. It's a huge area. And unlike other raptors, the snail kite feeds on one source of food, just one, the apple snail. But the apple snail lives underwater most of the time, really only coming up just to breathe, mate, or lay eggs. So kites are constantly soaring over the vegetation, scanning and searching for this prey, which is about the size of a ping pong ball. So this bird is basically able to find a needle in a haystack. I had to find some unique way to photograph that. So I went to Lake Okeechobee. I knew it was going to take a lot of preparation, but because of the size of the area, I also knew it was going to take some sort of bottleneck. So I teamed up with state wildlife biologists, and we built this submersible platform out of PVC, which would contain the snails just right at the top of the water column, along with a camera that I could trigger remotely. So day after day, I'm hauling all my gear out into the water. I'm just sitting in my canoe for nine hour shifts, just waiting, waiting. And it was miserable. And I, yeah, I began to get really discouraged when things were unsuccessful. You're left with your own thoughts and doubt really starts to creep in. Am I keeping the birds away? Is the camera keeping the birds away? And there's no way of knowing. And so you're constantly at battle with that part of you that just wants to say, I should just go shoot this with a telephoto lens and just be done with it. Four days passed and I had nothing to show. And I actually started to think that the image was, it was impossible. But I decided to give it one more effort and so I returned to Lake Okeechobee.
And after setting up the platform in a new flight line, I look off and I see a kite coming over the cattails. And I see him scanning and searching. And he gets right over the trap and he looks down. And I see that he sees it. And he beelines, he goes straight for the trap. Yes. <laughs> and in that moment, all those months of planning, waiting, all the sunburns, mosquito bites, suddenly, oh my God. they're all worth it. I can't believe it. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> this is crazy. Say that a lot. This is crazy. This is crazy. So is it worth it? Is all the time worth it? Is the, is the headaches, are the flights, are the, you know, renting hotels, are the, gosh, the, the lice, the water lice I was getting. Yeah, heck yeah, they're worth it. Definitely. Because they're showing you these new perspectives and, and, and these new, new ways of seeing this bird. Maybe to someone who would never be interested into it, maybe they can, you know, get into just a little bit of what this bird is about. And actually that video... Um, I'll audit myself here, it's not quite true. Uh, there's a little bit of a slip there because what really happened is that I spent seven days out there. And at first I had a couple friends and they were all gung-ho about it. They're like, Mac, this is going to be awesome. And you know, the first day we go out and it's like crickets and well, mosquitoes and nothing happens, right? And the second day and they're, you know, you could see them starting to waver and they're like, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go out. That's cool. Yeah, I'll go out. And after two days of waiting, nothing happens. And so by the third day, like, hey, uh, you, you want to come out? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out again. And they're like, oh, man, I got laundry. <laughs> you know, I got stuff. <laughs> I don't even know. It's just something. I got to do my toenails. Uh, anything but that. And so I waited out for, you know, four more days. And then finally, after I did, you know, I really did move it just maybe 50 more yards over one way. After watching these birds kind of fly in this same path, same path, I was like, okay, you know, maybe this will work because they just weren't seeing them. And as soon as I did that, I mean, it was instant and that light was golden. It was sunset. I mean, it was perfect. I had no friends. I was just there by myself. So I was a little delirious, you know, like Wilson, you know, like talking to the snails. And, and I'm sitting there by myself, and I'm off to the side, and the kite sees it, and he nails it, and he goes down, and I had six nails in the, in the little trap. And so he goes down, and I am freaking out, guys. I am, like, arms in the air freaking out and just yelling. I'm so happy, like, slightly psychotic. And then the female comes, and she grabs one. Boom, 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 all at golden light, the best possible conditions you could ask for. And, like, after, you know, I let the sun go down, and then I waited out to the camera, like, so excited that it finally worked. And I hit play on it, and not one photo was taken. Not one. And I was, <laughs> I was just like, no! But it worked, right? It worked. And so I just came back, you know, four more days until we finally got stuff like this, you know? New perspectives on maybe a familiar subject. They walk on water sometimes, you know? And then the, and the critical shot of the, the talons actually grabbing the snail. I love this stuff, you know, having a product at the end of the day, it's great. And of course, you know, I can't, can't not talk about gators in the Everglades. I do love alligators. I've always loved alligators. My parents threatened to confiscate my camera from me several times for coming back with photos, uh, <laughs> photos like this. And, but there, there's a logic behind it. There really is. You know, when a gator opens its mouth, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I really am not crazy. When a gator opens its mouth like that, where are its eyes? Right? Its eyes are on the top of its head. So when it opens its eyes, what can it see? It can see, you know, maybe that way in a lot of sky. It can't see what's directly in front. So you feel relatively safe after spending a lot of time around these animals. <laughs> relatively safe. Yeah, you calculate it. You calculate your risks. But alligators are very unique and not just not just here in Florida, but especially down in, in, this, in the southern Everglades. You know, they're not always the apex, well, the, most of the time they're the apex predator, but they're just as much as part of the system as anything else. But in the southern Everglades, they have this unique behavior in that they are the very architects of the Everglades. And so what they do is they excavate areas around them because the Everglades is governed by a dry season and a wet season. So what happens during the dry season as that water falls well, they have nowhere to stay wet and stay safe. So they start excavating these areas called gator holes. 
And they do that, and this is what it looks from, like from the sky. And they do that so they can stay wet and moist and be able to forage as the dry season happens. And so they actually physically alter the landscape around them to fit their needs. That's incredible. A gator, this prehistoric reptile, right? So it affects other animals, not just gators. It has an impact on the anhingas, on the birds, on the other fish that then congregate in these oases until the waters return and then they can disperse out wider. So one, one dry season, I decided to look for gator holes via aerials. And I started scouting for these because I wanted to find these areas in the very deepest part of the Everglades where gators have been known to congregate by the hundreds. You know, these little, these little pockets where there's no other water around in the dry season and gators can be found in the hundreds. So I walked through big cypress, we walked for miles and miles, and finally got to this one area. And it was one of the most incredible things I've seen. We get there and it's just calm water and just, you know, maybe, maybe a foot and a half of water and just backs rows and rows and rows of gators in the middle of nowhere. And then the coolest thing happened. It's like we interrupted their party, and they're all, you know, kind of looking at us. And there's that awkward moment where no one says anything. And then they go back to their party, which is launching out of the water and crashing down on fish. So they are actually jumping out of the water, landing down on these fish so that they can eat them. It's the coolest thing to watch this. You know, these millennia of behavior finally come into this moment where it makes sense. Why do they excavate? So fish will stay there so they can eat and they can stay wet. Pretty nuts. So we then came back because I wanted to see what it looked like when it was even drier. What do the gators do when that water's gone? So I watched the, the water levels and I decided to come back two weeks later when they were supposed to have dropped. And I come back and this whole place is almost dry as a bone. And gators are holding on to whatever they can to stay wet. They're crawling inside these logs that are holding water. Uh, this is my buddy's gnarly hobbit feet. Um, they're doing anything they can. And this is what I was after, is that crucial moment where that relationship between gator, gator hole, and water can be seen in one image. And so we walked out into the middle of these things, and there's about 120 of them in this photo. And... And people ask me all the time, they say, what was the scariest moment that you've had, you know, doing photography, doing this gator stuff? And this was definitely it. Because you're walking in this huge mud, basically a cesspit, right, of, of all their urine and all the, these dead rotting fish. It smells horrible. And every time you, it like, releases that smell even more, it's terrible. And you can feel gators that have burrowed down underneath. And so you're stepping on gators' backs, and you're going towards, and I have my buddy with me, uh, stupidity in numbers, and he's like, yes, you know, we can get out there. And I was like, I really want to take this, this one photo. And so we get down there, and we, you know, we're walking carefully and quietly and, and slowly. And we get down, and this is about a, you know, another 9 or 10-foot gator. And we, and we come down, and Mark's standing right next to me, and, and I lean down to shoot the photo to get down close. And the gator's about here, my, you know, I'm up to my knees in mud, can't really go anywhere. And the gator's just kind of watching me. And it's cold, too. You know, these guys are tired. They don't want to do anything. They just want to hang out. And so I bend down. I shoot two frames. I finally breathe. And then I look at Mark, and I smile. And then, so dumb, I then just, like, got up, like, okay, I'm done. And as soon as I get up like this, that fast movement, this thing just takes off. It just slaps the ground, throws mud all over me. My heart nearly explodes out of my chest. But as some, I don't know what it was like, you know, monkey instinct, just like, oh, better take pictures, you know? It's like, ah. <laughs> if I'm going to die, better, let's capture it. Uh, yeah, so that happened. I love gators. I love alligators. Very cool animals. And I get it, you know. You see them all the time, and it's hard for people to get on board with, you know, protecting the Everglades to save the alligators because they're ubiquitous, right? But there is a species in the Everglades that it doesn't matter who you are, you cannot help but love because they're pink and they're fuzzy and they're cuddly and they're also ugly at the same time. And that's the spoonbill, the roseate spoonbill. These birds are really, really interesting because what happened, and many of you probably know this, 
that the founding of the Audubon Society got started as the uh, millinery trade really started ramping up and birds, birds were hunted, wading birds were hunted to near extinction. The great egrets and especially the spoonbill populations were specifically targeted because they occupy a lot of South Florida and a lot of the coastal areas of the Gulf. And these birds fetch top dollar for their pelt. Their pelts were worth more than gold in weight. So all these poachers were flocking to South Florida to the Everglades just to poach these birds. And so as we came around the turn of the, the 20th century into the early 1900s, there were only two of these birds, two pairs of roseate spoonbills left nesting in Florida Bay. And this is after thousands and thousands that once were there. So as we started paying attention as this millinery trade was taken off, we finally banned the plume trade and these numbers started skyrocketing again. The great egrets came back, bald eagles started coming back, the roseate spoonbill started coming back, and we really started studying them and paying attention to what these birds ac actually represent for the ecosystem. And what scientists began realizing is that they are actually the perfect indicators for the Everglades health. And why is this? It's because they're their nesting times are tied to the annual drawdown cycle of water. And why do they do that? Well, they do it because they're tactile feeders. And if you've ever watched a spoonbill or a wood stork feed, they're moving their heads around. And they're doing that not because they're crazy, but because they have to touch their prey to be able to eat it. And how are you going to be able to touch your prey if you have water that expands all over the place? You're going to wait to be able to feed enough to feed your young when those water levels drop and those fish are concentrated, right? So that's what these birds do. So the biologists started realizing, hey, you know, these birds could represent the health of the Everglades. Let's just study them a little more. And study them they did, and they watched after the plume trade was banned that their numbers shot up. And they started getting up to 800, 900, 1100, 1200. They started really rebounding in the southern Everglades. And just as they started rebounding, we really started carving up that southern end of the system right there near Taylor Slough. We put in the C-111 canal and we stopped two-thirds of that historic water flow from reaching Florida Bay. And that had drastic consequences. And yes, these birds are cute and they're cuddly, but unfortunately the reality of, of the spoonbill situation looks more like this. Sorry. But it's true. We're down to less than 80 nesting pairs in Florida Bay today. After getting up to 1,100 after their comeback, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. But the encouraging part is that there are still pieces of the Everglades that remain. Still pieces of this system that are just waiting to be put back together again, waiting for us to take action. And this is why I love Florida, and I love South Florida and the Everglades so, so much. Because in one place you have this unstoppable force of mankind that is meeting that, that immovable object of tropical nature. It just refuses to stop. It refuses to fail. And we can do it. You know, we can bring this wildlife back. We can bring the water flows back. We just have to put our minds to it. We just have to put our dollars behind it. We just have to put our energy behind it as well. And fortunately, there are a bunch of scientists, there are a bunch of biologists that are out there that are doing this work. There are people that are spending their entire lives dedicated to the Everglades, to watersheds, to ecosystems. And we need that. We need people connected and we need people talking about it. Because what affects us in South Florida affects us here in North Florida too. And the best part about the Everglades is that it's a system that's entirely contained in one state. We can't blame Georgia. We can't blame Louisiana as much as we'd love to. We can't blame Tennessee. What happens here in the state is our own fate. And we can change it. We can do it. I know we can. And the best chance we have for doing it is just connecting people, is getting them outside, getting them connected, getting them to feel, what is Florida? Why should I care? What can I do? You can do a lot. Your dollar speaks a lot for you. Hire a fishing guide. You know? hire, an, hire an eco guide. If there's one thing that I've learned from working all these years with Audubon, it's you never, ever, ever underestimate the power of the birder. They control a multi-billion dollar industry. And what do they want to do? They just want to look at stuff through binoculars. <laughs> How sustainable is that? I mean, that's great. But they're not going to keep coming back, and they're not going to keep 
taking their binoculars, not going to keep spending money coming down if there's nothing to look at. The best hope we have is to getting people out there, getting people to see what the real Florida is. What are the real images? What are the real experiences? You can do it. You can do it. You can inspire other people to do it. It's easy, you know? Get your feet in the mud. Let that mud get between your toes, under your fingernails, and work its way into your heart. Take your weekends and change them. Put up a hammock. You're going to have a good time, I promise. The swamp will change you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mac. We, we have time for a couple of questions. So if there's anyone who wants to come to the microphone here and ask a question, you may come. Here is one person. Thank you, Mac. Please give your name. Uh, my name is Pat Abbott. Hey, Pat. Um, thank you, Mac. It's beautiful. Um, I followed one of the statements that you placed on social media last week, and that was the um, firing or laying off of multiple photographers for National Geographic mm. because of the new purchase of the magazine, um, which you reported as very upsetting. Sure. And it is very upsetting uh, because for people like me who are too scared or too out of shape or whatever to do what you do, we need these pictures. So how does a person like me, who is inspired by National Geographic, react to that? Oh, wow, that's a great question, actually. Um, well, to be clear, too, with National Geographic, a lot of people saw that coming, by the way. Uh, they saw the change in the acquisition, meaning that layoffs were going to happen. Unfortunately, they did start cutting a lot in the photographic department, um, which was extremely upsetting because you have some of the most talented uh, and long-term people that have been working there that, that got me shooting, that got people writing, that got people advocating, um, inspired to do that. Um, but National Geographic is not the only game in town. And I think that's the encouraging part, is that now what we're starting to see with social media and with blogs and with lots of websites is that we're, as photographers or as artists, we're having to find other sources and other ways of telling our stories, other funding sources particularly. And that's what Nagia is so great about, is that they will put their faith in you to say, you want to tell that story, we'll give you three months. Go get dirty, but bring back photos. You know, their motto is... Uh, we don't publish excuses, we publish photos. So they expect a lot of their photographers, and their photographers always deliver. That's why it's as impactful as it is. But now, I mean, especially for me, um, I'm just having to find other outlets, and I'm sure there are other artists out here that are finding other ways of, of doing it too. Um, it's really upsetting what happened to National Geographic because they are the gold standard in so many ways. Uh, but I still think that they're going to continue to be... Um, in a, in a way, uh, at least I, I really hold out hope that that's true. Um, so what can you do? I don't know. You can support your local artists. You know, support, seriously, I mean, you know, support people that are, that are telling the stories that you want to tell because I, I get overwhelmed when I just come back to Gainesville and I'm seeing so much opportunity to tell stories that I still haven't yet, you know, yet to tell. And it always just comes down to time and, and funding. And that's it. Yeah. Hey, Mac, how's it going? My name is Danny. I'm a PhD student in advertising here at UF. And um, I had a question. I know you mentioned that you're telling these stories through your photos and through videos like the one you showed today. And as someone that's really interested in, I'm interested in using new media, new technology to get people out, whether it's civic engagement, whether it's voting or volunteering, that's what I'm interested in. And I wanted to get your take on going beyond photos and beyond regular video do you think something like virtual reality and you know 360 degree video that you put a headset on and you're essentially in the Everglades, uh, do you think something like that bridges the gap and or brings people closer to, to sort of wildlife and gets them motivated to go out there and be part of that? Or do you think it's something that's detrimental and they sort of see it as entertainment and that's it? I wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
Wow, that's a good question too. Uh, I don't know because I've never done VR. Um, but I would imagine that, uh, you know, yeah, for a new generation that's looking for, you know, always, you know, the next thing, sure, whatever it takes. Uh, yeah, why not? I don't think, you know, I don't think any of us are going to be fooled that, you know, looking at photos is the same as being there or looking at virtual reality is the same as doing it yourself. I think there are people that are uh, inherently, I think just inside us, we not only want to know that wilderness exists, I think we also want to be there. A part of us wants to be there at least. And so I think no matter what you have, whether it's an iPhone or iPad or VR or photos or videos, I think that we're, people are going to find a way to get out there. And I, what I would hope is that as good as that VR could be, that people are like, well, I need to actually, I need to see what this smells like. You know, I want to see what it feels like. Yeah. Hey. How you doing, Mac? Hey, Felipe. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say as a UF alumni, you know, I think the work that you do, whether you realize it or not, I'm sure you do, but it has a huge impact in kind of like the next generation and the people that have no idea, you know, like how to get into like the field that you're in. It really does inspire people to just know that people like you exist and that whether the dream is kind of out there, surreal or not, it is possible. So, you know, thanks for inspiring, you know, from a long time ago when I saw you in Gainesville Magazine. Um, <laughs> but my question is, and I don't know if you've ever seen the documentary uh, uh, Through the Lens about a Nat Geo photographer. Yeah. yeah. And um, one of the things that uh, I, can, I think struck like stuck out to me in that documentary was how when, you know, this guy would go to Antarctica, he would go all across the world and deal with these, these issues at hand, these biological and just these devastating things that were happening across the world. And he would come back home and he would sit at the dinner table and want to kind of relinquish all that and talk about that with his family. And his wife was like, that's great, but I got to put the kids to bed. You got to help, you know, they've got an eight o'clock, like school time. Yeah. Like, yeah. so I guess for you in, in the work that you do and the travels that you've had, are you more inspired by the task at hand, kind of like as you see the natural world, and I hate to say it, kind of unfortunately diminish around us? Are you more inspired by that, or are you more inspired by the, the effect that your work has, and have you been able to kind of keep a balance of, you know, I'm, I'm Max Stone to my family, to my friends, and then I'm Max Stone, the conservationist and wildlife warrior? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can ask my family what they think. <laughs> um, that's a, I guess that's a somewhat loaded question. I'm, I'm inspired just by possibility. I, you know, with the stuff with the snail kite, for example, I just come, I, I think of an idea in my head and I just want to go get it and I enjoy the ride getting there. And I think it's the same for a lot of these photographers. They say, you know, here's the issue. And it's not just making the photos, but it's all about going to these places, meeting the people, and understanding the issues even deeper. Because the more you learn about it, the more you care about it. And then when you start caring about something, what do you do? You, you want to show that you care, and you want to do all that you can do in the capacity that you can do. You know, not everyone's going to pick up a camera. People are going to pick up a pen, or lawyers are going to advocate, or they're going to go to court, or you know, singers are going to sing songs, and, and poets are going to write poems. Um, this is just my medium of doing it, and you know I think you can ask my parents and my family that uh, I don't know I, I'm not Max Stone like the conservationist. I'm just you know I've been wading in swamps and I just love the outdoors and I've been trying to share that for as long as they've known me. And you know you're doing the same type of stuff. You know and you're telling stories with videos and you're telling making ing incredible videos. You're about to he's about to go on a huge expedition on Sunday to to Africa for five months and we feed off of each other you know I I, I grew up loving um, Joel Sartori one of the first photographers that mentored me besides John Moran here but one of the most powerful things he said to me is he said you know don't just photograph the butterfly he said I want to see the bulldozer behind the butterfly I want to see what's happening there tell me a story put your photos to work and and that really resonated with me and what Joel would do, not only did he go all over the world, but he did come back home. And he started finding his stories at home were the ones he ended up caring about the most. And that's kind of how it is for me, too. 
is that you feel like you owe it, not only to your community and to your friends, but also this place that raised you and kind of created this monster. Uh, you know, you feel like you owe it in a little bit of uh, sense of the word. So I don't know. You draw inspiration, whatever, whatever gets you going. I, I get inspired now by just the smallest little mentions from biologists. Hey, did you know about this? And no, but now I want to tell everyone else, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But it means the world to me, man, that you would say that. Thank I mean you. it. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Alice, and I work with your dad um, <laughs> and your mom and Pat. <laughs> and anyway, so uh, first thing is the crew this picture deep. really inspired our family. So now we all have hammocks like this from your picture. Yeah? Um, <laughs> Good. So that's one thing. And then the second thing, I mean, I lived here 43 years, and I think you should start a Max Stone outdoor education program. My oh, daughter goes to UF. She's a freshman. Half her roommates come from South Florida. They never knew, they all say this, they never knew Florida up here looked like what it looks like. They have no idea what's out there. Yeah. And, and it is beautiful. You know, we go out all the time, and I think you should do something bigger in Florida with this. That's my recommendation. It's great. Thank you, Alice. Um, let me say something first. Uh, just be very careful uh, with the hammocks. Uh, <laughs> this one, um, the trip after this, I get very cavalier with my gear, and it just kind of goes into a pack, and then I put it up, and I don't think about it. I, I slept next to a fire, and a little ember worked its way onto the hammock, and I said, okay, you know, just duct tape it, and made a little pancake, and then I went on a swamp to sea paddle expedition, and on the second, on the third day, after two nights of sleeping, you know, 20 feet up in these hammocks, on the third night, finally found a little spot, you know, in, these, in this little pine grove, and I'm laying down on it and I just kind of shift my weight a little bit and it births me out the bottom. So either wear a harness when you sleep or don't, don't get too high up. But you know what, the, the thing about the environmental education thing, you're right, but there are awesome environmental science teachers. My environmental science teacher from high school is here today and he's part of the reason why I'm you know, doing what I'm doing. I, I like taking pictures. And I like telling stories. I, you know, I don't know how good I'd be at taking kids around, but <laughs> or or how much their parents would want that after seeing you like you see this and you want me to take your kids out in the swamp. I don't know. No, but thank you. Yeah. No, there should be something. If there isn't, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Vicky. I am. Um, I'm actually a, a third third generation South Floridian, and I did not know, like I'm one of those people she was talking about, like lived in Florida my whole life, didn't know all of that was out there. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of people down there really don't know it's out yeah. there. Um, I worked for two years as an environmental organizer working against fracking in the Everglades. So you had mentioned um, when you were responding to another person about the bulldozer behind the butterfly. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how much you have been able to um, talk about oil drilling, talk, talk about like upcoming fracking, talk about Turkey Point, talk about all of these issues and connect them for people to see like, the, wow, this is a wonderful environment, but there are all of these other issues that are at play um, that are threatening it. That's not just like things that we see on a, a daily yeah, basis. Sure, more of a, like a reportage -y type stuff. Yeah. I try to do that as often as I can. And you know, with assignment work for, for magazines, that's, that's a requirement. You don't have an issue until you show what the issue is. And so, yeah, that's always part of it. You know, Ariel's my favorite tool to do that with because it finally puts everything in context of what you're talking about. Um, I haven't covered any of the fracking. I haven't covered the drilling. You know, most of uh, what I concentrate on is, is the wildlife aspect. Um, but sure, yeah, if, if I ever get sent down there, yeah, I would, I would definitely shoot that story. I've been wanting to tell a story on Big Sugar for a very long time. Yeah. You just, it's just so hard to get access. Um, you know, it's just really tough. But, it'll, you know, one of these days it'll happen. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all. Oh, wait. Do we have a question? Yeah, oh, okay, we, I'm sorry I didn't see you. 
Our last question then. Um, real quick, so I'm, I'm the photographer at the Natural History Museum in town, yeah. um, so your book is really inspirational to Thanks. me. My husband is a wetland scientist and does he has what water. A team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a, um, a wetland, a treatment wetland in Lake Okeechobee. So he's very familiar with all the places you've been. Cool. But my, this is my daughter, Ella, and this is Josie. And Ella is six. She wanted to know how long um, it, the paddle took you to get out to that tree. <laughs> to this tree right here? Yeah. This, oh, this, um, gosh, this is the memorial tree on Fish Eating Creek, which is one of the last undammed, unaltered waterways leading into Lake Okeechobee. It is a very wild waterway, and you can paddle maybe a mile and get there. When we went there, it was at like 11 at night, right, Adam? 11 at night, we didn't know where we were going. We were just looking for cool things, and we found this and said, yeah, this looks pretty good. We'll sleep here. So you can get there real easy. I'm sure your mom and dad would take you. <laughs> <laughs> We will. You're going to come too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sign me up. That's a great place to end. Thank you so much for all your questions. Thank you, Matt. Thank Matt, you. Matt. Thanks, y'all.